Dr. Glenn Davies, thank you for joining me today. My name is Jodie Brunning. I'm a trustee of the Physicians and Scientists for Global Responsibility, New Zealand. And uh, your work is tremendously exciting. Last year in 2021 at New Zealand's Primary Healthcare Awards, you won, um, you won, you were awarded General Practitioner of the Year. You've got a medical degree. You're practicing in Topoa. Um, you have been for, for quite some time. Um, you're, you studied at the University of Otago, but you've also worked overseas in in Papua New Guinea. Um, and so you've you've had sort of a reasonably diverse experience with different patients, different patient profiles. Um, can you can you talk to me about your background, please, and and how it's shifted you to the position you're in now, please? Yeah, well, thank you very much for the invitation to speak with you this morning. Um, it's it's raining outside. It's actually horrible. So it's nice to be inside uh, talking to you and, and not outside in the rain. Um, so I, I was pretty much a standard general practitioner. I, I don't think I was special in any way. Um, and I did that for 25 years. And as so many of my colleagues did, I observed that um, we were seeing more and more of these chronic health conditions, so more and more diabetes, more and more obesity, um, more and more cancers, more and more heart disease, and we really didn't seem to have any answers to it. Uh, it was it was perplexing. Um, and particularly diabetes, which has become my main interest area, uh, I viewed diabetes as a chronic progressive condition, um, which eventually would lead to uh, insulin injections, to limb amputations, uh, to dialysis, um, to strokes, to heart attacks, you know, and I, I just saw this happening before my eyes. Uh, I had only seen it progress. I had never seen it um, go backwards. And then... Um, in about 2018, there were a, a series of events. I, I listened to Professor Grant Schofield, who's the author of the What the Fat series of books uh, at a GP conference. And he was talking about low carbohydrate nutrition and the fact that diabetes was reversible. And, and I was going, what? You know, and, and in fairness, it was such a, a new concept that, that I was a bit skeptical. I also, um, at the same conference, um, listened to a bariatric uh, surgeon speaking, and she was also saying that diabetes is reversible with bariatric surgery. I was going, wow, wow, wow. And then in uh, December 2017, uh, there was a paper uh, that showed with a very low carbohydrate um, sorry, a very low calorie diet, this was 850 calories a day, uh, you were able to reverse diabetes. And I think it was 46% of the participants reversed their diabetes. And so I, I had these, these three kind of experiences where I was going, wow, is it is it actually possible? And, and then the sort of the fourth event was that a patient of mine called Wayne, he, um, he walked into my room between... Um, patients and he told me that I was bloody useless um, why don't I read something and he put four books or no six books he sort of dropped six books on my desk and he told me to read them um, which in fact I did they were they were all so there was Jason Fung's uh, book The Obesity Code there was Grant Schofield's uh, What Fat and there were some other um, more technical books on keto and in fact I read them and I, it was like that penny drops moment. It was like uh, diabetes is reversible. And the reason that we haven't been reversing it is that we haven't known how. And now we have this new tool uh, that allows us to reverse diabetes and obesity and all these chronic health conditions. And so that sort of became my passion. And then a group of us, including Wayne, we sort of formed a peer group. Um, we started meeting once a week and really just learning the stuff, discussing it. And then um, clients or patients became involved in that and it eventually became reverse T2 diabetes topol, which is now in its fifth year. Um, and that group is supporting people to 
use low carbohydrate ketogenic diets and fasting to reverse their chronic health conditions. Uh, and then that's sort of what I started doing in my practice. And at the end of uh, five years, there were 138 um, patients who had gone from being diabetic or pre-diabetic to normal, to having normal HbA1c. And that was from none. That was from only seeing it getting worse to now seeing 138 people reversing their condition. And it's now at 152 so the tally just keeps going up and of course during that time there's been an explosion of understanding and knowledge um, of the powerfulness of this dietary intervention uh, I keep learning um, the people around me keep learning but the beauty of this is that the people who are in this new community and in the reverse T2 diabetes community we're learning together because we're sharing information and experience constantly. So it's not like me doing this. It's like um, we're learning all this stuff together and supporting each other in this development of, of knowledge. And then, then it's the knowledge, but it's then the how do you bring about this behavioral change in individuals and in communities, which is the kind of the next step. And, and if we've got time, I can talk about a a community that did very very well and then everyone fell off the wagon and what we've learned from that so so that's sort of been my journey the the New Zealand GP of the year is an acknowledgement of the the powerfulness of low carbohydrate diet in a community it's not an acknowledgement of me so you know I've I've accepted that award because uh, it creates a little bit more authority to speak, I expect. But, you know, it's not a reflection of anything that I've done. It's a reflection of me learning from other wiser people and then um, a group of people applying it within a community. Yeah, powerful. And you are correct. There, I mean, there's been an explosion in the literature looking at this. And then you've got an explosion of medical doctors and endocrinologists that have had their own N equals one journey. And then they've transitioned their practices and they're seeing it in clinical practice. You know, so we see this hesitancy in sort of um, academic situations to, to sort of recognize that how powerful you know observation clinical experience is and um yet it's 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 this wave and of course for, for you you're seeing you know you're you're seeing a change i'm assuming in you know fatty liver in blood pressure uric acid lipids glucose you're seeing probably less um candida and you know you've got this cascade you know of not just you know cardiovascular, but it's it's cancer, it's psychi you know, New papers just come out looking at the the relationship with um, psychiatric um, illnesses um, as a keto diet is is put in play, and of course it's an amazing um, it's amazing process that gives people a structure to get off habitual foods that our ancestors were never consuming. Mm. So, so you're, and, it's the, and it's the, the community is central because without knowledge and education, we, we can't shift forward. So can you talk? Yeah. Can I, can I just pick up on a, there's a couple of things you, you, you talked about in there I'd like to pick up on, you know, in each um, country, there seems to have been someone that's led the way and, and perhaps um the person I would remark on most is Professor Noakes in South Africa, because Professor Noakes was the father of carb loading um, in sport. So he's a was a sports physician, and and carbohydrate loading was his thing. And he developed type two diabetes while training uh, for ultra marathons. And and so he had to go. Well, something's not quite right here. He researched it and concluded that. You know what he had been, what he had fathered, was was wrong. And so 
I have the greatest respect for people like um, Professor Noakes who have built their career on something and then have to say, look, I got it completely wrong, not just a little bit wrong, I got it 100% wrong. You know, so so those are the people that you really have to admire for their, their utmost integrity. You know, so so he's he's a great, great person. Another one is um, David Unwin, who's a GP in the UK that has done so much work and shown that, well, he sort of showed me that you can do this in general practice. You know, you don't have to be in a university with huge amounts of funding and and research fellows. You can you can make these sort of changes just in a, a simple general practice environment. Um, and the other thing you picked up on there is the delay of change. You know, um, um, do, have you heard the story of Semmelweitz? So Semmelweitz was a, a Hungarian uh, gynecologist and um, he, he observed that in the midwife run uh, area, the rate of the pural sepsis, so this is woman uh, dying of um, child birth fever or, or um, you know, like sepsis um, following childbirth um, was very low in the midwife run area, around 3%. But in the doctor obstetrician run area, it was dramatically higher and about 18%. Um, and he, he just wondered why. And what he observed was that um, the doctors would go down into the bowels of the hospital. They'd perform autopsies on the woman who had died overnight. And apparently it was a sign of mana to have lots of gore on your apron and your hands. They would then go up and they would perform examinations on the next cohort of women uh, about to give birth and then repeat the process the next day. And he just wondered what would happen if you washed your hands. Um, and he observed that when he washed his hands, the rate of the pural sepsis dropped to the same rate as the midwives. Um, and the, the the sad part of the story, well, there's two, well, the funny part, no, this isn't funny, sorry, the interesting part was um, he upset his colleagues so much by suggesting that they wash their hands that they threw him into a mental asylum where he died several days later from sepsis, which is the, the ironic twist. But the sad part is it was 50 years between him proving and writing up properly in, in literature that washing your hands prevented puerperal sepsis, 50 years before that change occurred. You know, and how many women, you know, like you talk about statistics, it doesn't have the human element. How many women died in childbirth in those 50 years throughout the world because doctors were unable to accept that washing their hands might create this change. And it's even worse when you look at, it was 200 years between proving that citrus prevented scurvy and it actually becoming uh, the norm on every British sailing ship. So 200 years. So I'm hoping it's not going to be 50 or 200 years before we see our diet advice changing the advice that um, in 1977 was born with the food pyramid, and, and since 1980 we've seen the tsunami of diabetes and obesity. You know, I hope it's not going to be another 50 years between us proving that the food pyramid's upside down and us actually giving the modern and correct dietary advice. Yes, and I mean you bring up you know, Thomas Kuhn, Thomas Kuhn, the scientific paradigm, you know, when you, you get the, the elite in a particular profession and they will lock in the paradigm and, you know, change out, out of that dogma occurs, you know, one death at a time as, as, the, as the old elite pass away and the new guys can come up and say, actually, no, it's not like that. So, Glenn, of course, you are one of the young new guys coming up, challenging the, the paradigm. Um and I haven't so, been called young for quite a long time, actually. Well, obviously Thank you. Are. <laughs> obviously are. And um, so, you know, I, I do urge anyone to go back and look at Kun's paper that are feeling a little bit sceptical about this because, of course, then we can look back to the 1920s when basically a, a low-carbohydrate diet was recommended for diabetes patients. So all you're doing is re returning to what was happening before insulin became 
you know, the crutch. And of course, of course, I say that knowing not everyone will be or will will be able to change, which is similar to any other, I think, addiction. Um, and so could you speak to that a little bit, please? Yeah, so we do have a, so numbers needed to treat um, for reversing diabetes or pre-diabetes with a low carbohydrate diet. Um, so um, I think David Unwin has demonstrated this the best and the numbers needed to treat are two. So every second person that he talks to about a low carbohydrate diet, um, reverse their diabetes or pre-diabetes. Now, there are not many medical interventions with a number needed to treat of two. So let's look at um, the use of statins to prevent a myocardial infarction. The numbers needed to treat 157. So we're talking about numbers needed to treat of two. So it's just showing how dramatically powerful this, this intervention is. Um, I did an audit yesterday morning of our pre-diabetes uh, group, and we're at 40% um, have reversed their pre-diabetes. And I'm sure that we will end up um, about the same place as David Unwin because many of those people haven't repeated their blood tests yet. You know, so, you know, I think that that idea of numbers needed to treat of two, um, you know, is is about right. And I, I think it's probably what, what we're going to be seeing. So, you know, numbers needed to treat with um, vildagliptin to reverse diabetes, it's infinity. It, it treats the symptoms, not the cause. It, it will, you know, what it'll improve or stabilize, um, but it, it doesn't reverse. You know, so that's the difference. That's the, that's the big paradigm shift here is instead of dealing with the symptoms of the condition, we're dealing with the cause of the cause of the cause. And that's, you know, if we can, Joe, that's where I'd really like to focus is there, there seems to be evolving two parallel systems. One mm -hmm. system is dealing with the symptoms, which, which is largely what pharmaceutical medicine is doing. And then I'm seeing this, this new, evolving, exciting paradigm, which is lifestyle medicine, which is dealing with the cause of the cause of the cause. And, you know, I'm, I, I don't know if we get back to the ultimate cause, because I, I think we then look at some of the social determinants um, of, of the issue, which, which probably is getting more into the cause. You know, we might need to look at bigger systems, but just sticking to the physiology, the cause of the cause of the cause, we come down to this mismatch, this genetic mismatch between the fact that we have caveman and cave woman and cave child genes, yet we live in an obesogenic environment. And so I think that is the basic problem, isn't it? We, it takes 20,000 years for the genes of a population to change to a map. Uh, in response to a major environmental change. Our diets have largely changed since 1977, when the Department of Agriculture, the US Department of Agriculture, introduced the food pyramid. And, and I'm laboring the point, it wasn't the Department of Health that introduced the food pyramid, it was the Department of Agriculture. You know, and, and that really does ask a question when it says six to 11 servings of grains per day, and that came from the Department of Agriculture, who was trying to sell grains, you've really, really got to ask, was that food pyramid designed to improve health? Or was this just a big marketing campaign to sell, to sell grains? And it was hugely effective, because that is exactly what we've done. We have introduced grains and cereals dramatically into our diet, and that corresponds with a dramatic increase in these chronic health conditions such as diabetes. So all that we are doing is we are turning that around, flipping the food pyramid upside down. Um, and I, I think a lot about what would a caveman's or a cave woman or a cave child's life have been like, because I think that's what really tells us how we should be eating. So if, if we can, can we have a, a imagine what that might have been like? So so hunters and gatherers, so um, I don't know how they would have 
created the division of labor, but um, a group would have gone out sort of mid-morning, I expect. Um, this would have been in the African savannah. And how they used to catch animals is they would chase them down in the mid-afternoon or the mid-day sun because humans can sweat from every part of their body, whereas animals can't. So humans are less um, susceptible to heat injury than animals. So apparently they chased the animal, followed them for about three hours. The animal eventually fell down, was able to be killed. I imagine they'd run about a half marathon during that time. Then they had to carry it back to the cave. They had to light the fire, um, prepare the animal, and I expect that they would have been eating once a day, not three to six times a day. There was another group in the community was probably doing the gathering bit. So they would have had meat and they would have had presumably berries, nuts and some leafy greens. And that is basically what a ketogenic diet is. That is a ketogenic diet that I think matches our genes. And I think that is what brings about the physiological changes that we need to be healthy. Um, not the way that we're eating since 1977, which is, you know, grains. And I can't blame it all on the U.S. Department of Agriculture because then there's a bit of blame has to come into the food industry because, you know, they jumped on this. And from that, we got a whole lot of high sugar highly processed carbohydrate-based foods. And our food environment now is based around those items, isn't it? It's a base, you know, we eat pizzas, we eat bread, we eat pasta, we're eating the root veggies, and that is the two-minute noodles. That's the predominant part of our diet, you know, whereas it wasn't the predominant part of our caveman ancestors. And then just go back 200 years in New Zealand and have try and imagine what the pre-European Maori diet would have looked like. And interestingly, um, you know, some of the, the early people that came on sailing ships described uh, pre-European Maori as some of the fittest, strongest, and most well people they had seen anywhere around the world. That was before they were introduced to the grains and the sugars. And then we look at um, Western A Price's research and we've seen um, a dramatic, quick change from, from that picture to, to quite a different picture. And, you know, this is 200 years. We're not talking about 20,000 years. We're seeing these impacts in a very, very short period of time. And you look at all, most, I don't know if I can say all, a majority of um, traditional people around the world, and you see the same pattern eating there and living in the traditional way you see health moving into towns and living uh, with European food and European cultures and you're seeing a dramatic deterioration in, in a generation or less um, to tooth decay, to diabetes, to obesity. And then you see, um, you know, in Australia, these wonderful um, studies where um, Indigenous Australian people are taken from the towns and cities and back into uh, living in a traditional way. And within seven weeks, we're seeing reversal of diabetes and, and, and significant weight loss. And all that's happened is they're eating in a traditional way. You know, so you're seeing the effect of the change in one direction and then the effect back the other way. To me, it is absolutely categorically proven that if we change and eat more of a traditional uh, diet and we try and eat um, more in the way that our ancestors ate um, we see reversal of these chronic modern conditions you know which are are serious conditions you know they're you know we're, we're talking about this metabolic syndrome the, the hypertension uh, the diabetes the obesity the fatty liver which then leads on to Alzheimer's and cancers and heart attacks you know this is this is chronic disease and we can fix it as simply as changing our diet. And, and that's what my mission has become. I think, thank you, Glenn. That's, yeah, that is, that is really it. And, you know, and when we, I think from what I understand, um, 
the researchers suspect that one of the big shifts came because, you know, humans were sort of weak and, you know, the carniv carnivorous animals would snack on all the, the carcasses and we'd rock up a little bit later and we'd work out how to break open the bones and eat the marrow and the, a massive, massive shift occurred through eating marrow, which of course is is fat and fat is energy and, and fat and fibre together is very satiating which is what we don't see in ultra-processed foods. And, of course, you know, in wartime, and you're not the first person to mention about these, these shifts in, in these interviews, but in wartime, you know, people would go to the country to, to, to eat well because that, of course, took them back to whole foods and, and garden-grown mm -hmm. foods and probably to accessing locally grown meat as well. And, um, and so you saw the shift from at, with urbanization but we also see this concordant shift as you say in in agriculture in in industrial agriculture and and the relationships there that that mean that you get um the the, the manufacturer of that and kellogg's i think in the us um the kellogg the power mm -hmm. of that movement helped with this as well um, and, and, of course, you have, and, and so, so I'm going to say you've talked about um, Grant Schofield, but his co-author was Karen Zinn and she's a dietitian. But what you can see, for example, with the UK dietary guidelines, it's, it's all dietitians doing the work. And, of course, dietitians still tend to, you know, apart from honourable mentions like Karen, dietitians still tend to look at calorie in, calorie out. Mm -hmm. um, can you talk a little bit to, the, to that yeah. idea? Well. That's the traditional idea around how you lose weight, isn't it? You um, eat less and you move more, and it has been an abysmal failure. It it should make sense, and it is so disappointing that it doesn't work because, you know, it's the basic law of thermodynamics. It should work, and it is so frustrating that it doesn't work. And because it makes so much sense and it should work, I think most health professionals – um, just keep persisting with it. And and the saddest part about this is when it doesn't work, how the health professional usually responds is he suggests or she suggests that the client is lying to them. You know, the client says, I've been exercising and I've been eating less and I haven't lost weight. They're, the thought that's in their head, I think, is probably well, they're probably sneaking a bit of stuff in that they haven't noticed or they're probably missing a few gym sessions. And that is not the truth. You know, we know from studies that people are have reduced fat and increased carbohydrates. We know that they are exercising, but they're not losing weight. And why? It's because it's nothing to do with calories. Well, sorry, that's an exaggeration. At the extreme end, it is to do with calories, but for most people, it's to do with insulin. And we have to completely change our focus away from thinking about calories in and calories out to thinking about insulin. It all focuses around insulin. So shall we um, just have a little talk about the role of insulin? Because this really is the guts of the matter. Okay, so this is kind of the, the little talk I go through with, with everyone that sits down in front of me with this kind of problem. So... So let's talk about what a low carbohydrate or ketogenic diet is. So it's carbohydrates, proteins, and fats. So these are our macros, yes. Now protein, basically just do what you were doing anyway. Just eat your meat, fish, chicken, eggs, nuts, and eat the about the usual amount. Now fats, dietary fats, they are fuel. So the fats that we eat, we will burn for fuel. So you don't have to worry about it ending up in your arteries or making you fat. We burn the fat that we eat for fuel. So we can eat saturated fats. We can eat fats that are high in, that contain cholesterol. We don't have to worry so much about it because it's fuel. So then we've got to come across to the carbohydrates, and this is where all the action is. So all that carbohydrates are, are they sugar molecules joined together. So when you digest those carbohydrates, it becomes blood sugar, sugar in the blood, yeah? And there is no way that the body knows where that came from. So they don't know if it came from a teaspoon of sugar in your coffee or a V drink 
or a healthy kumara or brown rice, once it's become blood sugar, which it all has to, the body doesn't know where it came from. So this idea of low glycemic and high glycemic to me is, is less important because it's all blood sugar. Okay, and then there's only three things that can happen to that blood sugar. One, it can get reconstituted as glycogen. Now, that's good if you run a marathon or do an Ironman every day because you'll empty your glycogen stores and then that's a good place to put it. But not many of us are doing that. Not many of us are significantly emptying our glycogen stores. So it's not a good strategy. This exercise yourself thin is not a good strategy. And we see that because a third of the Ironman contestants in Taupo are still overweight despite doing 20 to 30 hours of training every day. So to me, you know, that's not a good strategy. The other, the second thing that you can do is you can use it as fuel. But remember I said that the fats that we eat, they're our fuel. So that's not a good strategy. So any excess blood glucose from carbohydrates goes to the liver and gets turned into fat, which has to be stored. So excess carbohydrate through a process of de novo lipogenesis becomes fat, and that gets stored in these miraculous containers called fat cells. And, and why do I call them miraculous? They can increase in size a thousand times. Now, there are not many containers that I know of that have the capacity to increase in size a thousand times. So they are good at storing this fat that we are making from carbohydrates. Now, we started, so back to insulin. Insulin is what senses blood glucose. So that carbohydrate that becomes blood glucose is sensed by insulin. And insulin does one or two things. If insulin is high, it says to the body, store fat. And if insulin is low, it says burn fat. Now, it's not like a dimmer switch that most hormones are like slightly up or slightly down. This is on or off. Okay, you're in fat storage mode or you're in fat burning mode. And the majority of people in the Western world are in fat storage mode. And when insulin is telling your body to store fat, that is what it'll do despite lowering your calories, despite exercising. So what you've got to do is you've got to flick the insulin switch. You've got to flick it to low to be in fat burning mode. And when you're in fat burning mode, that's when all of this healing occurs. You know, So you've got to get your carbohydrates low enough for insulin to flick down, and then you start burning fat. That is why the Eat Less, Move More model has failed and will continue to fail while people have high insulin. And the majority of the world's population in the Western world is insulin resistant and has high insulin. They are, that fat ain't going nowhere. It's trapped in those fat cells until you drop the insulin by lowering carbohydrates. And that's the message that I think we have to be teaching people. Tell me about tofi. Tofi? Gout? Gouty tofi? So when you're thin on the... Oh, toffee. Toffee. toffee sorry. sorry. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so thin on the outside and fat on the inside. Yeah. So this is the idea of where do you store your fat in? And some fat storage is healthy. And let's go back to the caveman. It was actually that ability to store fat which allowed the caveman to live through the harsh winters. You know, so the fact that humans have now dominated the world is probably due to our ability to store fat. So in the at the end of summer when there was an abundance of food, they would have gorged themselves on apples and salmon and everything that was available to to gain fat, and then that would allow them to get through that harsh winter. They were probably skinny at the at the beginning of the new food se um, season, but they they survived. You know, so that is what we have been programmed to do. Now, that ability to store fat in a healthy way under the skin um, is fine, but when you start storing fat in an unhealthy way, which is around our viscera, so visceral fat, so, so internal fat, that is what seems to cause metabolic syndrome. And the problem is someone can be quite overweight and store fat in a healthy way. They will be metabolically well. 
somebody can be quite skinny, have a bit of a fat tummy and be metabolically unwell. So this kind of comes more into into your area, Jody, of around this 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 um, the sociological part of it, the fat shaming. You know, we we see fat people and we automatically assume that they are unwell, and that is not necessarily true. If they are storing their fat subcutaneously and not viscerally, um, then they are not necessarily metabolically unwell. Whereas somebody can be quite thin, have visceral fat and high insulin levels and be metabolically unwell. So, you know, and the idea of toffee, thin on the outside, fat on the inside is, is a reflection of that. And so that person pointing the finger and fat shaming could potentially be metabolically less well than the person that is carrying 10 kgs under their skin. So d does that sort of deal with, with yeah, the question? Yeah, absolutely. You know, because the waist circumference is, you know, is is such a huge um, indicator of this. And what I understand for for obese people, 20% of them are metabolically healthy. So mm. when we just do this fat shaming, it's wrong. And when we, when we misleadingly say that, you know, obesity and over overweight is the driver it ignores the fact that i'm sorry but ultra processed food and sugar is the driver mm. so we need to keep going upstream you know yeah. and look at that yeah and thank you 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 made a really good point there obesity is one of the as part of metabolic syndrome it is not the cause of metabolic syndrome so you know the the abnormal triglycerides, the high blood pressure, the obesity, um, the diabetes, that is all sitting together over there, all caused by high insulin, so hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistance, all caused by eating the wrong foods and eating too often. You know, so if, if I could just move on to that, you know, that is the fundamental problem. We are eating the wrong food and we are eating too often, whereas the caveman was eating natural, whole, unprocessed food, um, berries, nuts, meat, fish, chicken, um, above-ground vegetables, and they were not eating all the time. They were probably eating once a day, and they would have had these harsh winters where they were probably missing multiple meals. You know, so... That is what we're trying to reproduce with this, this new treatment regime where we're saying to people, eat when you're hungry, but if you are not hungry, then, then don't eat. This idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day is designed to sell cereals. That is not a health message. That is a marketing message to sell breakfast cereals. Breakfast is not the most important meal of the day. Um, if you are not hungry at breakfast time, and many people aren't, don't eat breakfast. Have your first meal a bit later, brunch or lunch. And if you're eating two meals a day, so two mad, eating two meals a day, that's fantastic. But a lot of people transition to eating one meal a day. You know, and, and that sounds, to a sugar-addicted uh, person eating six meals a day, that just sounds impossible. But many, many people... Um, in the circles that, that I mix in, eat just one meal a day, which is called OMAD. So, you know, I say OMAD, that's one meal a day. Two MAD, that's two meals a day. Uh, three MAD, that's three meals a day. But eating six meals a day is just bloody stupid, you know. So, so transition into eating less meals um, by usually missing breakfast. And if those two meals that you do eat, the, the lunch and the dinner, if those are jam-packed with nutrients, jam-packed with protein, jam-packed with healthy traditional fats, then you are not going to be hungry, you're not going to be craving, and you are able to miss that, that breakfast. So taking the, the sugar out of the diet stops people from being hungry. You know, and this, this hangry idea where, you know, this suddenly comes over you, you're irritable and you must eat, that's something that happens with, with people are, who are eating ultra-processed foods and a high-sugar diet. That is not something that you see in people that are fat-adapted and able to access their stored body fat. So, 
you know, we so eating whole foods, um, avoiding sugar, avoiding um, un, or highly processed carbohydrates, eating protein and fats, and eating less often. That's that's the message that that we are putting out there. And and the last thing is, what we are um, promoting is high in vegetables. So. The keto diet that we're promoting is not the antithesis of the whole food plant-based diet. We are, we are integrating all of the goodness in the polyphenols and uh, many other you know, beneficial chemicals which are in plants, integrating that with the traditional fats and the proteins to create what is a balanced diet. You know, you've got You've got above ground vegetables that are high in fiber, high in um, plant based chemicals. You've got high quality proteins. You've got traditional fats. That is a balanced diet. It's high in fiber. You know, the idea that it's only a balanced diet if it contains sugar, you know, it's only a balanced diet if it contains some processed white flour. Where does that idea come from? It certainly doesn't come from the cavemen. You know, to me, that's coming from marketing. Yeah, you correct there. And um, the, one of the, the biggest injustices I see is, you know, you look at fatty liver. And so we, you know, Robert Lustig's work shows us that fatty liver happens from alcohol as much as it happens from sugar. Yet we're seeing fatty liver disease in children and young people. You know, we've got the idea of toffee. And I, I believe, you know, we've got many young people that are pre-diabetic, if not diabetic, but because they're they're not fat they're not being screened so they're missing out on that gap but then you've got as well concurrently you've got the massive food addiction and so I personally tried to sort of stop sugar but I was still having symptoms of, of something I was trying to get rid of and so until I, I really lowered my what I would call my basic white carbs and so basically ejected sort of white rice and white sugar and white mm. white wheat or un, unfermented white wheat out of my diet I couldn't actually get away and and kind of like there was this massive sort of entrapment through the way these just simple you know the, the way the white foods um um, kind of captured me personally and I and, and so then I was thinking about food every 15 to 20 minutes for 30 years and so that that entrapment through addiction means that the the, the GPs dealing with like a 15 minute consult they're super aware of that they're super aware that food addiction drives so much of the harm and means that it's so impossible to get people off so t can you talk a little bit about the structure of your your clinic, your practice, and how that interweaves with, which I think is terribly important, which is the community groups, which to me is a similar model to Alcoholics Anonymous. It helps educate you, yeah. provide support. It's it's really interesting because we're also, food addiction is similar. So can you talk about the structure of your business, please? Yeah. So um, this is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about and I've been able to sort of reflect because I've, I've sort of stepped outside of the, the main medical model and, and I don't think I could see any of this while I was, um, you know, so ultra busy and overwhelmed um, within the system. Now that I've stepped outside, I, 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 I think I'm seeing things um, a little bit differently. So um, I think our basic nature is to be well, um, yet we have a... A sickness model you know rather than a wellness model we have a, a sickness model we use the word patient um you know and i i looked up where where does the word patient come from it comes from um the latin uh, i'm not sure if i'm pronouncing it correctly but i think it's party p-a-t-i and it means to be subservient to be patient to be compliant and i i say to my clients and I don't know what the best word is. Is it participant? Is it, um, you know, I, I don't know what the replacement word for patient is. Um, but, you know, I, I say to them, I don't want you to be compliant. I don't want you to be subservient. I want you to be the greatest pain in the ass. You know, I want you to insist that you get the best care. I want you to insist that it's explained until you understand. I want you to insist on having time for a, a, a conversation. Don't be patient. 
you know, don't be a patient. So um, when I do use the term patient, I'm kind of using it to refer to historical um, events. I try and use the word, word client, um, but if anyone can come up with the ultimate um, word for that that partner in this health journey, then, then please let me know. Yet we've got a sickness system and that's dealing with the symptoms, not the cause, isn't it? You know, so we're dealing with high blood pressure. We start a medicine that lowers the blood pressure, but we haven't said, why has this person got high blood pressure? And it's because their insulin is high um, because they're eating ultra processed carbs and sugar. So, you know, we're dealing with the symptoms and why, why has this happened? And I think it's because the pharmaceutical industry um, and there are some amazing pharmaceutical drugs, you know, um, Keytruda and cancer, extraordinary, you know, some, some amazing antibiotics, some amazing pharmaceutical drugs. So I'm not, you know, bad mouthing pharmaceutical drugs, but I think that we've taken it too far. I wonder if we should be prescribing maybe something like 15% of the number of medicines that we currently are. Um, yet this, this pharmaceutical-based medicine has, has overwhelmed the whole system. And the second biggest issue is time. You know, doctors and health practitioners get 15 minutes if they're lucky. You know, so to me, that's hardly enough time even to say hello, let alone to discuss the intricacies of diet and lifestyle and exercise and family and community and the way that we think and mindfulness and meditation you know like there is no way that's going to fit into 15 minutes so all we have time to do after we've taken a history done an examination um, made a diagnosis is write a prescription so all we have time left to do is write a prescription and that's generally what happens at the end of a consultation is we write a prescription which treats the symptoms of the problem, not the cause. When you're looking at complex and multimorbid um, disease, you're looking at the fact that you're, you know, I think I heard you mention, ten, you know, 10 drugs in 10 years. So when you have this cascade of illness, because you're not starting off with, you know, addressing hypertension at the start, for example, is that a lot of that 15 minutes spent working out how the different medications might interact? Well, yeah, it, it can be. And, you know, if you look at like the, the number one and number two cause of death in the Western world is heart disease and cancer. And I think they tend to flick around, which is the biggest. And then number three is medications. Medications are the third commonest cause of preventable death in the Western world. So I, I think that really says it all, isn't it? We're, we have limited time. We don't, as doctors, we haven't been taught the power of these lifestyle changes. We write prescriptions each time the person comes to see us. They don't feel better, so we write another prescription. They don't feel better, we write another prescription. One of those medications causes another problem that we write a prescription for, and we have this idea of polypharmacy. And, and just a little aside, I looked up the word de-prescribing, um, the stopping of medicines. It was first coined in about 2000, and that just blew me away. I thought, wouldn't the term de-prescribing have been started with the first medicine, but no, it hasn't. The, you know, 2000 was when that term came about. So that implies to me that the idea is once you've started a medicine, you stay on it. And then when it stops having its effect, you add another medicine and then another medicine, you know, and I, I think that's the problem, you know, rather than us going, okay, while we're changing your diet, you might need to be on this blood pressure medicine. Let's look at it again in a month's time and hopefully we can stop it. It's the idea, this medicine is with you for the rest of your life. Um, stop it at your peril. So that's a fundamental problem in general practice at the moment. And of course, many of the RCTs that of course got that product, for particularly when it comes to psychiatric medicine, onto the market might have been three to five years, certainly not 10 years. So when, when you are you know, repurposing or prescribing for longer that time, than that time period that creates other issues. And then, you know, with the polypharmacy, we're seeing, you know, the digestive tract 
um, impact. So that that then creates other other issues too. And of course, this is left outside of those narrow disciplinary conversations in a, in our siloized mentality. If we just look at insulin management. And so your so your clinic, how, what is the model? How have you arranged your clinic practice moving yeah. forward? Yeah, so so this idea that we now have some effective tools to deal with the cause of the problem is the game changer. You know, we now have low carbohydrate, um, ketogenic diets, but we also, you know, we also have a whole food plant-based diet as a tool. We have fasting as a tool. So we now have some effective tools that can actually deal with the cause of the problem so what i what i do now is i talk to people about insulin i talk to them about changing their diet but that's just part of the equation the second part is behavioral change you know and there are some people where you give them the information they go away they buy some books they they um watch some YouTube lectures, they um, go to some amazing sites like uh, Diet Doctor and they just go away and they change it and they come back and see you again and the problem solved. Um, but I think that's probably the minority, the majority of people, they struggle because food is so much more than nutrients and fuel. You know, food is so much part of our social structure, isn't it? And um, even more so in, in, in many cultures. Um, and I, it's probably true of all cultures, but, um, and I, I don't really want to pick some out, but, you know, if you say to an Italian person that they have to give up pasta, you know, they sort of will, will look at you and, and you've, it's like you've injured them. Um, you know, so much of um, Polynesian culture is, is based, around, are based around food. So much of, of our culture is based around mealtime. So, you know, this this idea that food is so much more than than vitamins, minerals, and, and fuel, you know, and, and this idea you've brought up of, of food addiction, um, we are addicted to food, but it is harder than alcohol. You mentioned alcohol and honest, but, but you don't have to have alcohol. You can just say, no, you have to have food. So food addiction is much more challenging because you can't abstain from food yeah, yeah. And referring to italians before when before industrialization and mechanization um, of pasta pasta would be antipasti you would have it as an entree you had a very small plate because it was handmade it was laborious to to, to produce so when italians were eating pasta up until absolute mechanization which i would say would be post-world war ii they were having small serves which of course didn't impact their you know their, their insulin but also it meant that you didn't have the broad broad scale um gluten intolerance you have now so of course italian kids have massive levels of gluten intolerance because they're not eating pasta like their ancestors did they the industrialization processes have changed that and also the hybridization of food has um, increased and changed the, well, it's increased the gluten content dramatically, hasn't it? So, yeah. um, and a lot of people say when they go back to France, for example, they can eat bread, um, whereas they come back to New Zealand, they can't. And I, and I think that's due to using some more of these traditional um, products, isn't it? Um, so there's very strong rules around the production of bread. And so you have what's called, um, you know, country bread, um, which is made in the traditional way. And then, you know, you have industrial bread. So the French are very clear about industrial bread versus traditional bread. And so when you buy the traditional bread, it's that lovely round, not necessarily baguette, which is can be more traditional, still better than most of our supermarket breads. But you know, there's a slower ferment. So, and what we, we do know, I make my own sourdough bread that'll fester for, you know, 12 to 24 hours. And that converts a lot of the, 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 the proteins that are not digestible into digestible proteins. And my observation as well is that that bread does not, um, it doesn't get attacked by, um, 
ye- yeast it doesn't you know sorry it doesn't get um moldy so it doesn't it doesn't start going off so i'm assuming that the sugar has a lot of the sugar has been fermented out of it so you know it's it's far safer for my gut and it's probably the bread that my ancestors consumed um and of course i didn't i don't eat much of it because it's far more satiating than industrial bread so we've had those these all these shifts post world war 2 that are, it's it's the convenience and so you know the the, the the idea is what is convenience you know which has been accompanied by we must have bread for breakfast we must have cereals for breakfast which is poppycock because none of you know farmers would traditionally go out go straight out do a physical mornings work and then come in for a cooked put cooked lunch you know so we didn't have that that convenient lifestyle mm. yeah um, and then what you've just said then is is kind of what we're promoting it's like um you know you go out and you do your morning training session or do what you have to and then when you get hungry that's when you come in and have your first meal of the day yeah um and yeah you you're sort of bringing up that some of these um, transitions to to the ultra processed food are quite subtle as well, and yet they have a big impact. You know the difference between sourdough and and supermarket bread. You know that they they just the, you can say well they're both bread, but there's there's some significant differences which have a big impact on our health. So you know we we kind of give these big sort of overarching statements like lower your carbs, stop sugar increase your traditional fats and avoid these ultra processed um, oils like canola oil, increase your um, above ground veggies. These are the, the big messages because because even though I, I will have half an hour to an hour with people now, that's still not enough time. You know, 15 minutes definitely isn't enough time. So we're giving these big statements, but then you're getting, you know, what you've brought up there talking about the bread in France there's, there's a whole lot of subtlety um, when you get down to these next levels. And what I've seen in the reverse T2 diabetes group is that people have got down to that level of detail and they are understanding all of this uh, this subtlety. So, yeah, there's a lot to learn. You asked me, um, I, I didn't get on to answering your question, how does our clinic look now? Um, so... Largely, someone will have a consultation with me, and let's say they have type 2 diabetes. We'll run through the science that we've kind of run through today, but then they will carry on with the health coach. So the health coach is individualizing that science to their own particular needs. There's a lot of things that people will say to a health coach that they won't say to me, and those things are so important to success. So just if we could talk about what a health coach is. So it's really this new um, group of practitioners and I predict that health coaches will become the major workforce in, uh, in primary care, so in general practice. I, I see that most of the work which will be around teaching people about diet and lifestyle will be done by health coaches. So, so what do they do? They, they do not judge. So they are non-judgmental. They they work on the client's agenda, not the agenda of the medical center or the agenda of the pharmaceutical company. So it's what's important to the client. They and when we say they work on their agenda, um, you know, they we will work on the thing that's most important to the client at that time. You know, and it might be too much to take all of this on all at once. So we might say. Should we just get rid of the sugar first? Or should we just reduce, stop the takeaways? Should we just introduce some intermittent fasting? You know, so, and they don't ask why. Now, why sort of sounds like a an accusation. You know, why did you do that? It's what you ask your kids, say, you know. But they will they will use questions like tell me more about that or that's fascinating or I've never seen it in that way before or um, wow you've taught me something tell me more you know this it's a it's an entirely different way of of questioning and the client will eventually come to their own conclusion so so that's what working on the client's agenda means and then supporting them and sometimes their role will be. Um, someone that's checked in with regularly so that the, the person is accountable. So, you know, that's 
part of the role, but I've just observed it to be hugely successful. It, it, it is the difference between what I was doing before and, and what I'm doing now because behavioral change is hard. You know, um, they say that a pharmaceutical rep has to talk to a doctor 15 times before they will change from one drug to another. So, you know, even, even within the pharmaceutical model of doctors, change is hard. You know, change is hard if it's the way you've been eating and your family has been eating for the last 50 years. It's hard to make these changes. So the, the health coach supports that change, works on the client's agenda. Um, you know, if, if the role, if they need to be accountable, they'll provide that accountability. And then the health coach will sort of remind me that we might need to follow up with blood tests. And so there's that feedback loop back to me when I need to maybe stop a medicine or I need to order another blood test. So, yeah, so that's that's kind of how our clinic is, is set up now. And is the health coach a, a weekly, a fortnightly? What, what, what are the models that you're seeing in your practice? Well, it's individualised because um, some people need a lot of support and others need, need less. Um, just a, a chance to talk about pre-cure. Pre-cure is probably where the majority of the health coaches in New Zealand um, are trained. And I think they do an exceptional job. So that's um, Professor Grant Schofield, Louise Schofield, and many others that are involved in that. And those programs are really high quality. Um, and, and our preference is definitely to employ pre-cure trained health coaches because um, they're so good. Um, a lot of people come from business, you know, they come from a wide variety of backgrounds. They don't have to be health professionals to be a, a health coach, but they do end up in, in training and behavioral change, but also um, training in nutrition. And then Precure offer other courses. They've got a, a mental health um, program as well. You know, so the problems that we see the most in primary care um, the health coaches are trained in those areas. So what we're seeing, of course, is your everything about the health couch, health coaches is is patient autonomy led, and of course, what you you know you were driven to change by your patient Wayne, and you know you know into yeah anyone anyone comes into your room called Wayne, just throw them out, they'll change your life. <laughs> Yeah, but we've got this convergence. We've got patient dissatisfaction. We've got doctor burnout. We've got physician apathy. And this has absolutely, you know, changed your life, you know. And it's the, the, the current model that's seeing increasingly the private practices being owned by, you know, venture capital, by hospitals, by insurance companies. It's, it's creating more barriers to, to doctors having autonomy as well as their patients. So you've, you know, it's been great that you've been able to step out and out of this. And so how long has Precure been around? Because you might not have been able to do this without Precure there. Yeah, um, I think it's around four years. Um, I, you don't quote me on that, but um, yeah, maybe, maybe something like four years. Yeah, they're really changing the landscape. And I think um, another organisation that I'd mention is the Australasian Society of Lifestyle Medicine. So they provide doctors and allied health professionals with training in lifestyle medicine because, you know, my focus is, is on nutrition and medical nutritional therapies. But we haven't talked about the importance of exercise, the importance of movement, the importance of sleep, the importance of social connection, um, the importance of the way that we think, you know, all of those other aspects of um, lifestyle medicine are, are so important as well. Although I would say that nutrition, in my opinion, is, is the most powerful of those tools. Um, the other things are important, particularly um, stress and sleep, you know, like I, I, we, one of the common places we get to is we see this, this weight loss plateau. We see people losing weight really effectively and then the plateau. And it's usually stress that, that accounts for that. And that's when it becomes increasingly important to deal with those other 
aspects of lifestyle medicine. And then you've got these, this really interesting um, new area of cold water immersion, um, which I just hate the thought, but um, that seems to be really, really powerful, um, particularly with mental health, saunas. Um, you know, so there's, there's many, many aspects of lifestyle medicine that give practitioners tools outside of the prescription pad. And that's, that's what I think is the key, having multiple tools and applying that tool at the right time. You know, if, if, a, if a carpenter turned up to replace your kitchen and then he had, only had a hammer, you would be a little bit concerned. You know, you might say, well, perhaps you might also need a drill. You know, if, if a doctor only has a prescription pad, to me, that's equally concerning. You know, I think you need to have a lot of tools in your toolbox, including the prescription pad. You know, because the prescription pad is still really important, but I'm concerned when it's your only tool. Yeah, this is it. And there's a, there's another, just returning to another issue that I thought about was this was sleep. Are you seeing, because sleep or an inability to sleep haunts so many people. And I, you know, nag my children and the people around me to increase their magnesium, which of course is, was traditionally connected to chlorophyll, to, to, to leaf dark leafy greens, which our diets are terribly deficient in. So are you seeing this switch helps people sleep better, which is a massive improvement to, to quality of life? Yeah, often, although... Fasting can sometimes make sleep worse because it dramatically increases energy. So, um, which, just to talk about that just for a second, I'll come back to the sleep, but, you know, let's go back to our, our cave men and cave women when they went out hunting. If the next day they didn't, so if they didn't get a kill, if the next day they were sluggish, um, couldn't think, brain fog, no energy, they would have died. So, if they didn't get anything to eat the next day, they're actually sharper, stronger, um, more powerful, you know, and that's what we see with fasting. So sometimes people have difficulty sleeping when they're fasting because they've got so much new energy that they're just not used to, you know, so sometimes we've got to ease off on, on fasting a little bit until people adapt. Um, melatonin can be quite useful for sleep. Um, we would talk about sleep hygiene. And one of the biggest issues is what people do before they go to bed. Um, and, you know, blue light and screens and phones. Um, taking the phone out of the um, bedroom can be uh, a really... So swapping your phone alarm for a traditional old-fashioned alarm clock can make a difference. So, yeah, we magnesium, as you say, there's, there's quite a lot of interventions that, that we can make. But stress is what interferes with with sleep and and that racing mind um and just mindfulness is helpful um slowing down um and it kind of leads on to this this is a lifestyle this is this is not a diet change this is a lifestyle change and and i try my hardest to reflect that so there's a greenhouse just out there there's a whole lot of raised gardens there's a couple of um steer in the um, paddock at the front, there's chickens that are producing six eggs a day, you know, so that's what I'm trying to do to be authentic in this, this space to try and make my life reflect what I'm teaching. So getting up in the morning and feeding the chickens and collecting the eggs, you know, to wow. me, that's connecting me back to this, this traditional, um, older, slower pace of life. Um, I now consult two days a week rather than five. You know, what I was doing, I would probably be spending half of my Sunday catching up on the paperwork from the week, plus, you know, working really long hours at work. You know, now I consult two days a week and try, I've tried to make my life reflect this lifestyle that I'm promoting. Um, you know, I've filled the rest of the time with research, um, speaking to incredibly interesting people like, like yourself, um, reading, you know, so like it doesn't mean that my life's become quiet, but I think the difference is to be able to choose 
to spend your time the way that you want to or that you choose to spend it is different from what I was doing before where there was no choice. Yeah. And you've you've made me think about urban people, urbanites that might be living in an apartment or something like that. And they they seem to think that if they have to change to this where they've got to not eat the convenience food, it's going to take a lot more time. Um, and I've found that my own personal shift um, has meant that I don't think about food as much. I'm not eating the six meals a day. I'm taking care to prepare two meals a day that that really are yummy and one of those two meals a day might take 15 minutes to prepare and the other might take 45 minutes you know depending on my creative juices on that day but it's helping urban people realize that there can be the shift can be just as meaningful as you know as people that do live in the country or maybe have more resources because I'm interested in this shift um, for people that are lower income that are struggling because we see such a big problem with metabolic metabolic syndrome with low income families and groups. And when you actually shift to two meals a day, you know, the, the, it's, it's as if the, the financial cost that sh that shift becomes different, but it's, becomes actually more meaningful but it's it's similarly affordable because you you're, you're not on the same med medication schedule and you're you're absolutely right for my own self I could not exercise until I changed my diet first because I did not have the mitochondrial energy I, so I am super supportive of dietary change first yeah and you've brought up some really important issues and you know it does cost more to buy cabbage broccoli cauliflower and and steak than it does to buy two minute noodles and white bread and some sizzler sausages without a doubt it costs more but you can mitigate that to some extent by buying in season um, by the the fattier cuts of meat tend to be cheaper um, so but it doesn't it's still going to cost more you know this this does become an investment if you are going to eat well it, it is an investment and you are so right. There are many, many people that are struggling where doing this complete change might not be financially possible and you might have to make some, some tweaks. One of those tweaks is definitely eating less often, as you say, and not snacking. So really real. Another thing is even if you're living in an apartment, you can grow some beautiful vegetables and, and pots and you know planters, which look spectacular. Um, especially um, herbs as well. So, you know, there are some some things you can do in an urban environment as well. Um, yeah, and cost is, is a, a massive barrier, um, no doubt. Uh, so, yeah, big, they're, they're big, important issues. And where metabolic syndrome is most prominent is in lower socioeconomic um areas so yeah ab absolutely true and I don't have the solution to that I would love to see some of that change coming from from right at the top from government I would I would love to see an acknowledgement of the fact that if we change the way that we eat um, we are going to spend way less on the downstream effects of that so if there was some way of making vegetables and high quality protein cheaper, um, that would be fantastic. If there was some way of disincentivizing the purchase of these ultra processed foods and soft drinks, I think that would be perfect. If there was some way of swapping the um, income from the soft drinks and um, to subsidizing the high quality proteins and the vegetables, even better. Um, I'm not a politician, I certainly don't want to be. Um, these problems are system-wide problems that are, are tremendously difficult to fix. I, I'm not putting my hand up for that role. Um, but some, some of this leadership does need to come from the top. It needs to come from government. At the moment, I'm seeing all this leadership coming from the grassroots, and, and it's big. You know, this, this movement, Justin Topol, for example, um, one... One little um, comment I'd make is um, Ryan O'Connor 
who I did a podcast with recently, he said as in his work as an um, um, optometrist, he says that in Topo, everyone he sees with diabetes knows what HbA1c is and they know their HbA1c. Where he was previously working in Tokara, he said that he had to explain what HbA1c was. You know, so so even that to me shows that that there's an awareness in the community and these conversations are probably happening, you know, and, and that's how the change occurs. And at the moment, that's what's happening. This is coming from the ground up. I, I think it's now time there's enough evidence, uh, there's enough demonstration of effect for some of this leadership to come from the top down as well. Yeah, absolutely. Um, redistributive or Pagovian taxes are absolutely possible and likely and you can put a much smaller tax on ultra processed food and you can redistribute that to um proteins um and to vegetables and and it doesn't the vegetables don't just have to be fresh vegetables they can be canned vegetables they can be um they can be frozen because it, it, it's yeah. like the nova guidelines you know you, you can that we know how to compartmentalize what sort of food might last for a longer time but it's not ultra processed so we can actually there's making i mean if we can put all those algorithms on in the social media and in the internet we can certainly put a few algorithms into our to food food to reduce our health 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 system costs um so you know it's absolutely uh, possible uh, there's a paper phil baker that i've quoted before um but that they've been keeping the social determinants outside of food and health policy for a very long time um and there's so much evidence in the literature supporting um food as change you know and, and julia ruckledge's better brain book shows that that's the case as well um you know, and there's this ongoing exciting, you know, information coming out. You know, a recent paper on um, ketogenesis looked at testosterone levels and, and that improved, you know. So it's, it's you know, you have a, the idea that one partner might want to do this and the other partner doesn't. Well, if, if the, the, the bloke knows it might improve his testosterone, maybe he'll, he'll be a little bit more interested yeah. because, you know, for so many of these families, it's getting movement family wide and and that's really hard and so i think that's where the community work is so important um we, i guess we're coming to the end is there a little bit more you know would would you like to talk about um other research work you're doing or anything else that you'd like yeah. to do? i'll have a um just a brief mention of cost you know because it's been predicted by 2040 that diabetes will be costing 3.5 billion dollars per year in new zealand um, and when you when you calculate that mathematically, the, so each diabetic is costing, uh, I think it was nine and a half thousand per year. So you know, just in Topol, we've seen well, well around one hundred and fifty people reverse their diabetes uh, and pre-diabetes. So you know, I'm not a um, a health economist, but just if you take that basic numbers you know that's about a million dollars saved something something like that you know and that's just in one little community what would happen if instead of there was just our small group of people what if that group expanded we must be able so instead of one gp it becomes a hundred you know that's a hundred times a million dollars we can save a lot of money just by talking about healthy nutrition. So I think this is important. Can we get it into medical school curriculums? You know, we've got two medical students that we're associated with and um, they say, no, don't tell us that stuff will fail the exams. You know, don't, 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 please just shut up. Cause if we write that, we will fail that paper. And it's like, so if you write the correct answer, you're going to fail. Yeah, so please, T tell us next year, <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, well, there's there's a problem there, so that it has to change there, doesn't it? Um, so, yeah, we can save a lot of money by doing this better. Um, yeah, um, I get it as a, fun, as a final sort of statement. Um, I think that these, so eating less, so eating the correct food and eating less often, that if that could become a, 
a, a, a slogan that was everywhere, I think that would be a really effective public health um, message, even if that mm. meant that people just went, what does that mean and how do I find out more about that? But, you know, we are eating the wrong foods and we are eating too often. Um, if we can start stop eating sugar, ultra-processed foods and these horrible refined modern oils and swap it out for traditional foods and only eat when we're hungry, we would see a massive change in health, mental health, physical health, um, cost, you know, everything. And and you, you sort of mentioned there physician burnout and physician apathy. You know, I certainly don't feel like that anymore. I'm excited about my consulting days because because I know that this is really effective. I know it makes people feel more energetic, sharper, feel better, happier. So I'm excited about talking to people about it. When uh, when when we're on a diet such as this, there will be a Saturday night and there'll be a party. There will be a weekend where we go away with friends. There will be, you know, blowouts. And the thing is, this is part of the joy of being human, you know. So I love that, you know, personally I'll behave myself all week, but then I might go out with a mate and we'll have pizza and drink lots of red wine and we'll be humans, you know. And when, you know, for, for people that are really that have to have a very strict diet, diabetic diet, otherwise they're going to end up in hospital. That's one thing. But most of the population aren't like that. So for people when they're looking to change their culture and change their knowledge and change their education, they can do all that but still know there are those moments where they can be a normal human and they don't need to be perfect. But, but they, overall they end up experiencing more joy because, it, because health is joy basically. Yeah, it's that, that's a really good place to finish. The, the, this is not an all or nothing sort of thing. If, if you're eating 80% of the time, you're eating whole foods cooked from home um, only when you're hungry, then, then that is going to be a massive change. And another thing is that if you do have your red wine and pizza, that doesn't mean you've fallen off the wagon and now from now I'm going to go home and have wheat picks for breakfast. It just means that, wow, I really enjoyed that. That's the first time in two weeks that I've had any white flour. Man, that tasted good. And then you're back on the wagon. And that's what the caveman would have done. You know, they would have come across a, um, I don't know, I can't think of the example. Strawberries in season. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and they would have picked out on them, even though, like, strawberries are good for you. It's actually hard to think of a caveman, you know, a caveman equivalent of pizza. I don't know what that would have been because it just didn't exist. But, you know, there would have been times where they overate, and, but that was okay, you know, because we've got genes that allow us to do that. So, you know, it doesn't have to be all or nothing and you haven't fallen off the wagon just because you've had one night of pizza and red wine. It's a really good message. It's not all or nothing. This is, this is something you're doing for the rest of your life. So, you know, you don't have to be good all the time. God, and how boring are you if you do that? Thank you, Glenn. Thank you for this time. Thank you for the work you're doing. And you're right, you know, you've created a, a knowledge bubble, you know, in the Topo area and these bubbles and, and you know, grants creating knowledge bubbles and, and throughout New Zealand, you know, Julia Rutledge is creating knowledge bubbles and they all overlap. And, um, you know, listening to the GP conferences, the, 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 the presentations that are being given from from other friends, I'm quite astounded um, at that that there's a, there is a real shift in knowledge and and what what is available to to help with GPs in New Zealand too. Um, I think it's really exciting and thank you for being on this massive massive tsunami of hope and joy and energy and intelligence that that is going to help a lot of people. Thank you for the work you're doing. Oh, thank you very, very much um, for the opportunity. Do you mind if I just say one other thing? Um, I just, I, I really hope that nothing that I've said um, makes me sound critical of my colleagues because I think 
health professionals are beautiful, caring, and wonderful people. I just don't think the system is supporting them to be the health professionals that they were trained to be. So uh, nothing that I've said is a criticism of them as individuals, um, but I will put my hand up and say I am very happy to be critical of the system because the system is not supporting them and it's not supporting their clients. You know, So um, any health professionals, I'm, I'm not critical of you. Um, you know, you're you're fantastic, with without exception. It's it's the system that needs to change. Yeah, yeah. sociologist, it's structure and function. And we've seen how powerful the institutional forces are that are shaping medical guidelines and that are helping fund, that are, you know, helping doctors pay for the cost of their new clinic, that are that are quietly shaping and structuring them towards that, towards this this end that is the 15-minute quick consultation. But, of course, I absolutely believe that many of the physicians and doctors out there, the clinicians, are seeing the contradictions in their own families. And I think I would just hope that a lot of them bring to their patient practice the the inner contradictions um, and... I do, I do think that medical training, and I think this is in the sociological literature, it's, it's very, um, you have to obey. And you actually, you were inferring this before. You have to obey. You have to do what they say. Otherwise, you simply don't pass. And the stakes are too high for these young undergrads if they, if they don't get through. So they must conform to the idea ideology that's put in that's structured into the the whole curriculum and and i think you know there is massive scope for change and uh thank you for thank you for being one of those change makers glenn okay thank you jody